Corey, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk to me about landscape uh, with a visible hand. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for thanks for talking to me. Yeah, uh, I, I was telling a friend of mine, uh, this was the film that ended my streak of uh, ending Sundance on a bad movie. Uh, <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> that's like 10 years in a row of like always ending on a bad note. And this is the first time uh, in a while that I had a good one. So it was, it was oh, good. Uh, well, it was thank good you. One. Impressive. <laughs> 10 years of anything is an impressive streak, though. I hope, hope we can start <laughs> the new streak next year. <laughs> but uh i i was totally unfamiliar uh with the book going in like i didn't really know anything i went on it based largely on your name you know like your previous two okay. movies and um and uh but i coming out of it i was fascinated by it so i, I like added it to my my reading list like oh, good uh but what was it that when you when you read uh mt anderson's uh, book that made you say i want to make this into a book well i guess for for context i'm always I always say I'm like a very restless filmmaker. I get very bored of uh, anytime, anytime probably any filmmaker spends like two to three years living inside a particular world, it's easy to want something dramatically different. Yeah. So I was certainly looking for something different from the kind of, you know, very subtle sort of human scale dramas that, I, that I'd done before. Um, I wanted to do something with a really strong genre element. And I read this book, my friend and producer, uh, Jeremy Kleiner sent me M.T. Anderson's book. Uh, and I was just struck by how um, it, how, how it really, on, on one hand, had a lot to say about sort of themes that I that I care about, about sort of corporate consolidation and the free market and the, the dangers of the free market and colonialism. And but it it took all of those on in a very uh, I wanna, not, not unserious, but a very goofy, sort of deliberately unpedantic way. It was a really, really bizarre kind of central metaphor of this like economic alien invasion. So that really spoke to me and it, and it just felt really hard to adapt in a good way. And visually, I knew it would take a lot of kind of invention and I was excited about that. Um, so yeah, I read, I read the book and, and it just felt like a story I really wanted to bring to the screen. When I was, when I was watching it, I was, I was thinking, and I was like, what were some of the things that I want, like, I was wondering like if there were things in it, in the book that you're thinking, I want to bring this into the movie, but I'm not so sure that it would work in the movie because it seems like there's a lot more that you could have put in here. Yeah, yeah. The book is, the book, I would say, we stayed very true to sort of the overall, um, the overall tone of the book and the overall kind of conceit of the book. We certainly made some changes, particularly kind of in the, in the second and third act to get wonky about it. And that was just, kind of instinctive more than anything else it, I just felt I, I think MT Anderson the author was very understanding of the from the beginning when I first talked to him of the fact that the book would have to change in certain ways to make it onto screen and um, so like uh, the whole invention of the, the the little well maybe this is a spoiler but yeah, I, don't spoil too much. I want people to go see yeah, it so. say there's a second act there's a whole <laughs> second act kind of arc that was yeah. uh, an invention from the book but I think is very much in line with sort of the the sensibility of the book at least that's the hope um but yeah it wasn't anything that i didn't want to bring to screen because it felt too big or too strange or hard to bring to screen or anything like that i just thought there were certain ways that really went in like the runtime of a movie i could kind of condense the themes and, and ideas of the book you were mentioning how you wanted to do something more in kind of the genre space this is that for sure but it is definitely not your typical alien invasion movie. I know people going in are gonna be like, alien invasion movie, great. That's one of, I'll be honest, that's one of the things that drew me to it. And also mm -hmm. one of the things that I like about it is that it's not what I expected. Um, uh, I guess my question is, how did you wrestle with doing this thing that you knew was gonna be a little bit offbeat for people while also trying to draw them into it as well? Being able to draw them into it. Yeah, I think that was just, the even in the first sort of pitches to the studio, to our partners at MGM, it's like, this is going to be a very unique sort of genre of meld. It's going to be uh, sort of a science fiction movie that still has this very sort of human, almost like kitchen sink realism element to it, butting up very sharply against these really sort of absurdist visual scenes. Um, and to me, that was in the DNA of the book. You know, if, if I were to take this really wonderfully unique book and make it a... Uh, you know, a, a movie where Adam has like a ray gun and is leading a Vogue <laughs> rebellion at the end of the book, uh, at the end of the movie, I think that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been true to the material and wouldn't have pleased anyone. And there are easier ways to make a really traditional science fiction movie. So for me, 
as soon as we had the material and as soon as I was sharing that with the studio, it, it became clear that this was going to be uh, kind of a hopefully a unique maybe even subversive take on the uh, on the alien invasion genre that was certainly in its DNA from the beginning. One of the things I've, I've liked about your your previous two movies and this one is that um, they they bring me into like in a world I don't think I've, I've that I'm personally familiar with whether it's kind of the, the posh upper class world of thoroughbreds or or Long Island of of, uh, of bad education I don't know those worlds. And this one feels unique to me too. Do you look for things like that? Do you look for things that are a little bit kind of kind of off on their own in a way, you know, kind of isolated that most people don't realize when you don't, or recognize uh, when you think about things you want to do? I think so. It's a good question. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have linked those projects in that way myself. But I think now that you say it, it's very true that they're like, I'm drawn to niche worlds or to subcultures to some degree uh if you can call like wealthy connecticut a, a subculture which i suppose it is uh maybe not a, maybe a, a over culture or something more sinister yeah. sounds but a um but uh but yeah and and i with with my first movie thoroughbreds that was a world i kind of knew as a as a guest from sat tutoring in in some like very posh, large Connecticut homes, mm -hmm. and the particularities of the world interested me. And that was really my way into that, even before the characters. Um, and then Long Island in, in Bad Education, that was Mike Mikowski's wonderful script. He grew up there. So we had this wonderful kind of built-in script consultant who knew the world really well, in addition to a great screenwriting, collab uh, a screenwriter and a, a collab storytelling collaborator. And uh, that world was fascinating to me too and was i live next to long island i live in in manhattan but i didn't know uh wouldn't say i was an expert in the long island world but your question points to the fact that yeah even even less traditionally world building esque projects still have an element of world building in them i think if you're doing them right and with this one this is the first time that we deliberately wanted to create a kind of archetypal or sort of deliberately could almost be anywhere town in it specifically because it had such a sort of strange reality from the premise of this alien invasion that had had changed earth in all these strange ways um but yeah i'm definitely drawn to sort of uh, my favorite movies all take the audience not just on a specific ride as far as the plot or or towards specific characters they're going to meet but into a specific world that, that will hopefully linger with them after they've seen the movie uh, when you were uh, thinking about how you wanted to bring uh, the Vuv to the to the screen, how were you? How did you decide how you wanted to do that? Like when I was watching, when I looked at them, at first I was kind of like, well, they don't they don't really scare me. They're kind of like Alf in a way, like I, like, <laughs> yeah. like don't really scare me. But then they're also kind of off putting too. They're like they're also kind of make you kind of a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, how did yeah. you decide how you wanted to do that and bring them to the screen uh, in in the, in the way that you did? Well, I'm glad you had that reaction because it was pretty close to the reaction we really <laughs> wanted the audience to feel. We, you know, it, the, again, the whole interesting, provocative premise of the book is that these aliens come and they're not big, scary destroyers. It's not the, you know, Ridley Scott alien monster that can yeah. destroy the strongest human super soldier or whatever. They are very, uh, they're bureaucrats, right? And they're, and they're, uh, they're capitalists. They're not uh, conquerors. And so... We kept talking about, you know, the you, sitting across from this thing should almost feel it should feel uncanny and unreal and uncomfortable, but it should kind of feel like you're confronting like the the robot voice on the telephone that tells you you're 87th in line to speak to a human. You know, it should be kind of annoying to be in the presence of these things. And so that, a lot of that was the visual design with with Eric DeBoer, and and a lot of that was um, the, the the way that they talk, the sound design, and the language that I kind of invented uh, along with with uh, Gene Park, my longtime kind of sound, all things sound collaborator, who was a huge part in, in shaping those creatures. I really love the cast. I, I, I was particularly fond of the relationship between Asante Black and Kylie Rogers' characters. Uh, I thought Tiffany Hash was fantastic too. Talk to me a little bit about the decision on, on who to cast and what you saw in them that made them perfect for their roles. Yeah, so in this case, like Tiffany had been top of my list of just people that I've wanted to find a role for since Girls Trip. I was that movie's very far from the types of movies I typically make, but I was just so <laughs> taken by her performance and 
I mean, love the movie. And I thought she just like completely captured the screen while she was on it. Um, and she's so, so just, she, I've been looking for a way to work with her, uh, for, for a long time. And I approached her about this role. Uh, luckily she was, you know, just, just crazy enough to be interested in, in this movie. And, and I think it's, you know, her, um, her sense of humor and, and, uh, the sort of absurdity of some of her sense of humor the and just the, the strong like groundedness of her own personality and the way that her own personality comes across on screen those all felt like very important things to bring to this world in that role um and working with her was was just such a blast well Corey, this has been fantastic man i appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk to me about a uh, landscape with a visible hand uh hits theaters on august 18th uh i believe uh right about yes. that all exactly right. yeah. thank you so much it's been uh absolutely my pleasure talking to you thank you man i appreciate it good luck with the film thanks for checking out the show if you like what we're laying down please subscribe to our channel and click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest stuff <laughs>